Do you find it hard to speak in public, on video or in interviews? Do you struggle to get your unique voice heard? Well, today we're joined by Emma Weiner, founder of Speaking at Work and a voice coaching expert. She helps influential women and leaders amplify their ability to be heard, cultivate the grace to influence and become recognized as an impactful leader. Welcome to the Unified Brand Podcast, brought to you by Elements Brand Management, a weekly brand building and brand strategy podcast to help you unlock your brand's potential, stand out from the competition and create impact. Today, we're joined by Emma Weiner, founder of Speaking at Work and a voice coaching expert helping influential women and leaders amplify their ability to be heard, cultivate the grace to influence and become recognized as an impactful leader. Great to have you on the Unified Brand Podcast, Emma. It'd be good to learn a little bit more about yourself, what you do, and speaking at work. Sure. Hi, Chris. Thank you for having me. Yes, so as you said, my main role is to help women. I do have some male clients, but I have to say mostly women raise their visibility and their credibility within their organization. So they get respect for the work that they're doing and that they get recognized for all that hard work and especially for their expertise. That's really, really important. And then the outcome of that is that they get rewarded. So if they're running their own business, that means they get paid. If they're within a corporate structure, it means they're going to get paid and potentially promoted. So the way that they turn up, the way that they are behaving within their business, the way they're using their body, their breath and the voice, all kind of feeds into that. So my organization is dedicated to helping women raise their profile, like I say, within and beyond their organizations. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. And it's something that is really needed, definitely at the moment with the kind of disparity of what we see in the workplace and things like that. So yeah, that's really cool. So how did you get into voice coaching? Well, I had a bit of a squiggly career. As I say, I started off as a speech and language therapist. So I worked with children for a while and I found it quite difficult in the NHS. And I say that with a very guilty conscience because you know the NHS is an amazing organization and my parents both worked in it for their entire lives but it wasn't the organization for me. So I left and joined a startup and we ran global events for different organizations, mainly law and pharma. And my role became, I was operations director. So I would look after our clients and I, I, my job was to work out what's the messaging. Why are they coming together? What are they trying to get their audiences to be thinking, feeling and during and after this particular event? And then that kind of translated into my production team coming to me and saying, Emma, these guys, they're the worst presenters we've ever seen, which weirdly happened every time. Can you help? So I'd go and I would help and, and I loved doing it, but I felt like a complete fraud, even though I had my degree in voice coaching. So I decided when I had my kids, I didn't want to keep traveling in the way that I was. Sold my shares and I went to Central School of Speech and Drama and I did my master's degree in voice coaching and training because I really wanted to help women use their voices for good, for good in the world. And I knew from my personal experience and from those people that I was coaching in those, at those conferences, that that wasn't always the case. Yeah, definitely. So on that journey, what were some of the things that really sort of brought you to where you are, but helped develop that skill? So the things that kind of along the way, the sort of the milestones that helped to develop the skills for the voice coaching? I used to be really embarrassed about that squiggliness. You know, because I had friends who grew up and they became doctors or lawyers or psychologists. You know, they kind of knew what they wanted to do and off they went and they did it. And that meant after their maternity breaks, they had something very clear to go back to. I knew that after my maternity break, I couldn't go back to traveling around the globe and working for 20 hour days in a row and then come back and be a decent parent. It, it wasn't going to work. But what I found was now that I've done my master's degree is that when I'm coaching my clients, Actually, having worked in the private sector, having worked in the public sector, having been an entrepreneur and built a business, I have all these different skills. So I understand I'm not a marketer, but I do understand how marketing works. I'm not a salesperson, but I understand how sales work. So I'm able to draw on all of those skill sets and then say, okay, well, if that's your business goal, if that's where you need to be in a year's time or six months time, then these are the skills you're gonna to need to help you get there. And then we can build that into the coaching. So actually having had that sort of slightly squiggly journey, I feel like I've now got these huge resource of skills and experience to call upon. And so I can empathize with my clients, but also say, ah, right, I know what you're talking about here. 
what we need to do is go and do this exercise because that's going to help us understand where we've got stuck right now. So actually, that squiggly journey has been super useful. And now I look back and think, thank goodness. Thank goodness, because it makes me a better coach right now. Yeah, definitely. It's interesting that the amount of people that I, I speak to who have had a non-linear journey mm. and actually how that helps in what you do and, and giving you that sort of 360 view of different things can add even more into who you are, differentiation, what makes you unique and sort of standing out. So mm. with this emergence at the moment, even more so, I think with, with LinkedIn becoming really prominent, mm. this need to have a personal brand as well as your company brand. How do you see the work that you do fitting into developing that personal brand? I think personal brand is really, really important. And I know that this is a word that gets banded about an awful lot at the moment, but authentic. Having an authentic personal brand is absolutely vital. If you don't show up as you when you're speaking, whether that means you're writing or you're doing a social media post that's a video or you're like this being interviewed on a podcast, if I didn't show up as me, I would be doing my business a disservice, but also the audience is going to pick that up. They'll sense through my voice because I was being a forced jolliness, you know, I'm because I'm being overexcited, I'm forcing it. The audience would hear that immediately. Or if I was feeling very nervous and it's going to come across my voice because it's shaky, because I'm not quite owning my expertise. So unless we're really, really clear about who we are, we can't show up as authentic. And if we're not showing up as authentic, then your listeners or your watchers, if they're watching you, are going to make fairly quick decisions about the authenticity of you and your brand. Now, if you don't feel authentic, if it doesn't feel like it's quite truthfully you, they're going to extrapolate that to your business. They're going to extrapolate and say, well, she was all right, or I wasn't quite sure about her. They make that same decision about your business. I mean, everybody knows the no like, and trust pathway. So every time you speak, every time you're interviewed, every time you write something, unless it's authentically your voice and the voice that really represents your business, your customers, your clients, your potential customers and clients don't get an opportunity to decide whether they can get to know you and decide whether they get to like you and therefore whether they're going to trust you with their time, their energy and their money. That's really interesting, actually, thinking it from that point of view. So if you aren't turning up authentically, you're actually not giving your audience a chance to connect with the real you. You're not actually showing up in that way so they can't connect with that real you. I think that's a really good way of looking at things and it reminds me of something because we've had a one-to-one -one before and we've been in a networking event before. I remember we spoke on that, on the things that you gave to me as a little a piece of advice I still think of now is you were saying, think about what you want the audience to take away from it. That mm -hmm. was the thing you were saying. You were saying about what is the one thing you want them to take away from what you're saying, whether that's in a video or speaking. And I think that really helped to focus in a lot of regards with the videos that I've been doing and, and stuff like that. So are there any things like that that can be reframes of what we do naturally that can help people to build a confidence when presenting, when speaking, when delivering presentations? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that one's a really, really key one because sometimes when we have to do those social media videos or we're being interviewed, we can get a little bit kind of stuck in the like, <gasps> everyone's looking at me or everyone's listening to me. And suddenly you feel all this pressure because it's all on you. But as you say, if you flip that around and think, well, what's my intention here? What I want for my audience, do I want them to understand a bit more? Do I want to educate them? Do I want to inspire them? Do I want to transform the way they're thinking about something or change a behavior? If you really go back to the kind of intention then it's much easier to forget about the attention that you're going to get. And if you just focus on the fact that you want to inspire, then if that's what you want to do, then that becomes much easier. It will, that idea, that concept of inspiring will drop into how you turn up. So how you sit, how you stand, the words that you might use, the stories you might tell. And so it will kind of feed in to what you'll deliver to the audience. So that you're advocating for yourself and for your brand or for the product or service that you might be talking about if that's what you're doing. But you're doing it in a way that's really serving the audience. So rather than about getting the attention, it being all about you, it's actually really this is about your audience. This is about them. I think that's really, really important. That's really cool because one of the things we do in, in workshops we work with brands is 
developing a brand personality. So you're developing how that tone of voice and the voice of the brand is going to come across. By extension, potentially, that could be extended into the people that are representing that brand in order to filter that through to the audience. So you could take on board that if it's a sage-like experience and knowledge, they could have that knowledgeable approach. But then if you tempered that with, if they were, say, the jester, a slight jester sort of feel to them, or if they were doing a bit more of a the hero side of things, if you could add that into your presentations, that's a really, I hadn't thought of that, how that projecting that personality through the individual, as long as it's authentic, could have on the brand. Absolutely. I mean, if I take my brand, for example, so my two sort of starting points is the sage is one of them. So whenever I'm coaching, when I'm talking, I will often refer to research because when I'm teaching something, I don't want people to think, oh, well, I've just come up with that. And this is just, you know, a good idea, or I want to do this exercise. It's like, look, we're doing this exercise because this is what the research says. So this is what the theory is. Now I'm going to give you a practical tool to help you be able to do more of that theory whenever you're turning up and whenever you're speaking. So it's about giving people the right kind of information for me. Now, if I was a different person, I might have a completely different approach to that. I might not be using that sage. I may never refer to the research and I might kind of connect much more with the caregiver. And so it might be much more, it's okay, you know, you might not enjoy speaking, but come into my sort of safe space and I will help you feel a lot better. I'm going to look after you. Now, depending on where you fit, you're going to use a completely different tone of voice. You're going to use different language. You're going to use different research or not use research at all. And it will really affect how you come across to your clients and the, the structure of your events or the way that you talk and the kind of feeling that you want to create in those events. So really, yeah, absolutely. Understanding where you fit is very, very important. Yeah, definitely. I've never been more conscious of the way that I'm um, presenting my voice on a podcast. Like I had it with the um, previous one where it was the personal branding. I've <laughs> sat up in my chair and I was kind of uh, a little bit worried about how I was appearing and stuff. But um, the same thing here, which is good because you start the question, you start to then grow and develop. So what I was going to say to you is tonality is interesting because with me, sometimes I find that my tonality can be quite monotone in some situations. So how does tone play into what you're trying to deliver and how do you develop tone in a way that is for somebody like myself that's a little bit monotone that's authentic and not forced yeah yeah we don't want to move into that force if we try and force things with the voice it just creates more tensions and then that makes it more difficult it's a really interesting thing that happens okay so if i was to ask you about your favorite pastime you know you would probably start to talk with much more what i would describe as vocal color But whenever we get into business situations, particularly in the UK, to some degree in the US as well, and and to some degree in Europe, but it's less true, is that we lose that vocal colour because there's this really strong correlation in businesses between emotion is bad. So we don't want emotional businesses. Emotional decisions in businesses are, are risky. Emotional people are unstable. Emotion in business is not a good idea. It's this kind of concept that we have. And so... What's happened is that expressivity, our ability to kind of really be enthusiastic and passionate about what we're doing, has been lumped into that emotionality. And then it gets taken out of the way that we talk. So everything becomes a little bit more monotone. I describe it as like a bandwidth. So we tend to, in the UK, kind of talk in a business way in this bandwidth. And actually, we have a huge bandwidth available to us. And it's really about dialing back into, what do I care about this? Why do I care that these people understand this topic? Or why do I care that they understand how to apply this data? Or why do I care that they don't feel so anxious next time they have to get up to speak? What is it about this situation that I really care about? And if we can dial into that, our ability to express ourselves will be much more expressive literally (laughs) it'll it'll just have so much more color it's a bit like if you went to the theater and saw an actor just deliver the lines so they've learned the lines and they're just going to deliver the lines and then actor one says something actor two responds there's no it doesn't live and it's the same way if we write a presentation and we're just delivering the whole thing because we just need to get to the end it doesn't live it's not real there's no connection between what you're saying and what you feel so it's really key to start reconnecting with why am I telling these people this? What's the purpose here? 
Why should they care? And dialing into why you care, because if you can demonstrate why you care, then they're much more likely to. But yeah, it's about dialing back to what's the emotional connection for me in this conversation. Yeah, I can see that. So what is it that you love most about helping women, but also leaders find their voice? So what is it that you love the most? I would say it's about opportunity. So often people will come into a coaching situation, whether they're entrepreneurs or whether they work in a corporate space, they come in and they're like, well, I would like to do this in the future, but you know, there's this and there's this and there's, and there's, so there's lots of barriers between what they would like to do and where they are uh, mentally. Sometimes there are actual barriers as well, but they're never as big as we think they are. And so I think one of the things that comes out from coaching is by the end of it, they're like, number one, they realize they can be themselves, that they don't have to be an entrepreneur like that person or a leader like that person. It's like, oh, I get to do this my way. And actually that's the best way I can do this because that's the most authentic way I can do it. So number one is that they realize that. And number two, often by the end of coaching, they kind of go, oh, I set my bar a bit low, didn't I? I was kind of thinking I could get here, but actually I could do that thing. It's like, totally. Yeah. Because now you've got the skills to get yourself in front of the right people, develop your own thought leadership so that you are saying the right things at the right time in the right way. And therefore you're going to get noticed. You're going to be more visible. So I think knowing who you are, being authentic is the number one. And number two is getting out there and having more opportunities are definitely the two big, like, yay, <laughs> happy moments for me and, and definitely happy moments for the clients. On that side of things, what are some key factors in effective communication? What are the main building blocks of effective communication? If you want to think about it in a sort of really simplistic way, but I think this is really important, you can think about two things. You can think about warmth. So we make a decision when somebody starts to talk to us, we make a decision about how warm they are as a human being instantaneously. So even before they've spoken, when they take a breath, we're deciding, mm, I could quite like this person or, oh, no, not sure. So we make that decision instantaneously. And then over time, we make a decision about competence. So if you can present and talk in a credible way, so if you're using human stories, if you're using data to support those stories, if you are taking up space on the stage, if you're using silence really effectively, you become more credible. So we have to have a balance between that warmth and that credibility, that, that sort of confidence and competence. If we don't, if there's too much warmth, we're like, oh, it's really nice. They were lovely, but there was no substance. And so we're likely to kind of think, oh, they were nice, but forget about it. If there's a huge amount of this sort of competence and they're really efficient and they're really, you know, everything is delivered very kind of perfectly, but without any warmth, without any human connection, without any authenticity, we will go away, but we probably won't take any action. We'll probably remember some of it, but we only really take action when we're moved, when we have an, an emotional connection to do that. So we have to have this balance between warmth and competence. So I always say to people, don't try to be perfect when you're talking or presenting or in an interview, there's no such thing. And if you try, you're going to trip yourself up. But I would really try to express yourself. So really express your ideas. Use language, the emotional language, sensory language that really describes your ideas rather than in a sort of clinical data way. Because again, you don't connect with it. So really to kind of build the blocks of having gravitas and having kind of executive presence when we're talking is we need that combination of warmth so having an open face an open body you know a nice warm tone to your voice and having this competence being able to support our ideas with data with facts with stories and deliver it in a confident calm way then you're going to do really well so do you find one of the best ways to do that a vehicle to do that is through storytelling so having stories that then back up, like you said, the data side of what you're talking about, so the competency, but using stories to describe that. Because one of the things I love about your LinkedIn and your LinkedIn profile is the use of stories and the use of really interesting ways to get a point across and, and to teach somebody something, but in a way that is memorable. I find that really, really interesting. So do you think is storytelling the best vehicle for this or is it just a tool in the toolbox? 
it's definitely a tool and it's definitely one that's underused in business. Um, is it the best one? I am slightly biased. I think storytelling is amazing and I think it can be really, really effective because, and I'm going to steal a phrase here from Dan and Chip Heath, but stories are sticky. They stick. You know, one of the things we lost in lockdown was gossip. You'd phone a friend and they'd say, hi, how are you? Yeah, great. We've been up to nothing much really. And then there'd be this bit of silence because you wouldn't be able to go, oh, did you hear what so-and-so's done? Or have you heard the latest about? There was none of that because nobody was doing anything. There was no gossip. And the reason that we like gossip is because it's a story. It's sticky. And so in business, if we can use stories to um, engage our teams, to engage our clients and our customers, they're much more likely to remember it than if you said, you know, look, this thing is really important and it's really important that you do X, Y, and Z. If you can illustrate that with a story, they're much more likely to connect with it. I talking about LinkedIn, I posted something about my son doing a, a speech. He had to do a speech at his best friend's for mitzvah. And that by far and away got more reads, more likes, more comments than anything else I've ever written about anything ever. Because it was a really sweet story about me trying to interfere as a, a speaker coach and him actually just nailing it, being himself. So stories stick. We can digest them whole. We know what to do with them. They're part of our DNA. So absolutely, I think stories are a hugely underused tool to connect with your audiences. If you use a story that really shows your audience, you understand where they're coming from. It's you're already moving along that no like trust pathway much more quickly than you would by saying, well, I've got 20 years experience doing this and I've got this degree and that degree and no one really cares. Yeah, they want to know what you're like as a person. They buy you, first of all. So do that through a story for sure. Yeah, I'm seeing that barriers being broke down a bit because I think for a long time, like you said, the emotional side of business wasn't really allowed to flourish or the things that mattered, you know, and you're seeing things now, especially from sort of the branding side and the marketing side where people are trying to infuse stories into it, be a bit more human and be a bit more open and transparent. And it's interesting. I had a conversation with somebody the other day who did storytelling and brand storytelling, and she was talking about, and I still remember it now. They told me about it the other day, and it was kind of, it was to do with a lady who was in risk management, and she couldn't get across what she did to her employees. And she ended up basically talking about a story from when she was a child and that she was walking along a path. And her mum would say to her, if you see a copperhead snake, drop your bike. If you've got your bike, stand still. And then take a couple of steps back. And when you are far enough away from that snake, you turn and run. And the company took on board exactly what that meant as in risk management. If you see a copperhead snake, that's the risk. To manage the risk, you need to get away from it. So they took it on board and they started actually referring to it in the company culture as copperhead snakes. And it kind of took it on board as that culture, which I thought was amazing. And I still remember the whole story. And she told me this was like three weeks ago. So it's amazing how powerful from a memorability point of view stories are. And yeah, I think you're absolutely right. And I get that with your LinkedIn posts. So, so on that, how easy is it for you to consistently, because you're very prolific with those posts, come up with those stories and those points on a regular basis? It's taken some learning and some training and some coaching. But when you start to think you change the way you look at things, and you start to think about things differently, it's like actually, everything around you is inspiration for a post. So, you know, when I'm walking around, when I'm with the dog, when I'm with my kids, when something happens, you know, I wrote a post the other day about being in B&Q because my son decided he wanted to build a go-kart. And suddenly when we were there, it was like, oh, yes, this is a lesson in leadership. And, you know, so quick, like two seconds on my phone, write it down, and then that becomes the post. Because once you start to think in that way that everything is material, everything is a story, and you can make that connection between what you do and the rest of the world, it starts to become easier and easier. But I'm dyslexic. And so writing is not my preferred medium. So it's taken some coaching to get me to the point where I'm going, oh, no, I can do this because I'm talking about what I love. I'm just trying to find that connection through the story. So I actually love doing it now. I really enjoy it. I, I like making the most obscure links. The more obscure, the better. And I sort of challenge myself to find something more interesting or more unusual each week. But uh, it's a really important part of, of connecting with my customers because I feel like they know who I am because of the way that I do it. And I try to keep my tone of voice the same when I write and when I speak. So again, I might use data, but I wrap that data up in a story. One thing I'm always struck with when I talk to you is, and you said it earlier on, use of language. So the way that you visually create pictures with your words, I think is really, really amazing. Because when you were talking about competency and warmth, 
And when you were describing the stories then and how you created stories and you were telling a story about creating stories, it was kind of about how you're in being here and it became leadership. But earlier on with warmth and competency, um, the words you were using to describe the warmth felt warm. They mm -hmm. felt like you were describing this, the way you said you use color to coloring the words and things like this. I find really interesting. Is is that intentional? Is that yourself? Is it a bit of both or have you learned how to do that? It's absolutely intentional. Um, the more sensory language we can use, the easier it is to connect with other people. So if we go back to that story you were telling about the copperhead snakes, you know, when you just say the word snakes, everybody will have a visceral, like a body reaction to that. So some people have been going, like my mum, for instance, would be going, oh my God, oh my God, a snake, you know. They'd have a, a kind of a physical reaction to it or they'd have a curiosity reaction to it, but there would absolutely be a visceral reaction to that thing. You talked about dropping the bike. Everyone's dropped a bike. If you ride a bike, if you've ever ridden a bike, if you've been around people riding, you, you know what that sound feels like. So you know that clang of when it hits the floor, it's got a really distinctive sound. So when your client was doing that, when she was talking about that snake appearing, the bike dropping, and then taking two steps backwards, and we can all know what that fit, that sense of kind of like, slowly take that step back, don't move too much, don't breathe too much. So the more the sensory language we can use, the more the visceral connection, so the body connection that you'll have with the people that you're talking to. There's some amazing research by this guy called Uri Hansen. He's a neurologist and he's put two people in MRI machines and got one person to tell the other person a story. And they're watching their brains through the MRI and exactly the same parts of the brain light up when you're telling stories and when you're using that sensory language. And it's eight different bits of the brain. Eight different bits light up when you're telling a story. So you're literally planting ideas in somebody else's mind. So the more sensory language you can use, the more areas of the brain light up. And that's why stories are sticky. That's why they stay in the brain because more bits are activated. If I was just telling you some data, it's only two parts of the brain get activated. So there's just less, literally less stickiness. There's less areas lighting up, less memorability. So the more you can use that sensory language, so touch, taste, smell, what's the other one, sight? <laughs> uh, the more you can use those, the more it will resonate, literally physically resonate with your listener. Yeah, there's that transformational effect, the journey as well, that like you said there, when you were describing it, you get taken on that journey along with the person who's describing the story to you. You're kind of there with them. You're there and there's some work done. I don't know whether it still carries on into adulthood, but there was some work done with mirror neurons and the idea that you, as a child, you have these mirror neurons that when someone does something, you replicate it. And it's why kids will, my kids do it now, <laughs> to a fault, watching the same film over and over again or the same program over and over again, constantly. Um, they love being constantly over and over again. But that is because they are replaying stuff and they're learning things. They're doing it like just everything from the way that they talk, the tonality to the physical moving and all that sort of thing. But there is some research to show that potentially that still happens into adulthood. And when you're being told stories, rather than doing it physically, because you'll see some children actually copy things physically, that you do it in your mind, the stories. I find that really interesting, especially when you said there are like lots of different areas of the brain light up, that you can actually get through to somebody in that way. You can mm -hmm. actually relate something to somebody in a way that they can really take it on board, I find really interesting. Yeah, I mean, you can, not only that, but it, it works for yourself as well. So if you're telling yourself a story, I'm not a good presenter. I hate being interviewed. I get nervous. I stumble over my words. If you're reiterating that story to yourself all the time, you're strengthening that neural pathway. You're telling yourself that story and you're reinforcing it every time. So, you know, some of the work that we do is, is about stopping those stories and starting to create stronger, better ones so that you're telling yourself the right kinds of stories. You know, I'm beginning to get more confident. I am more confident. I'm loving this, you know, whatever it might be. You know, everyone will have different stages. But you, you, the more positive language you can use for yourself and the storytelling you tell yourself is, is as important when it comes to establishing that personal brand as it is the stories that you tell your clients. Yeah, yeah, 100%. What are some things you can give the listeners that can help with that? Obviously, like you said, telling the right stories to yourself, but there are some things around mindfulness. Are there some things that you teach with regard to the ways you focus on certain areas to change those stories? Yeah, absolutely. So I think one of the first things that's really critical, and obviously this would be true of you know, a company brand as well, is that you've got to know who you are and what you stand for. 
So what's the most important thing? Where are your boundaries? What will you and won't you do as an individual and therefore won't you do as a business? Until you've got that completely clear in your mind, just like any other marketing, your messages are going to be muddled. So it's really important to understand who you are and what you stand for. So if you haven't spent much time doing that for you as an individual, you might have done it for your business, but you might not have done that for you, then it's really important to do that. You know, And going back to kind of what do you want to get out of the business? Because your business is meant to support you rather than the other way around. You know, it's, it's your life, not the business's life. So what is it you want to get out of the business? And really establishing that as your clear boundaries. This is what I stand for. This is how I'm going to serve people. And this is my tone of voice. This is how I want to come across to people. If that's not clear, then nothing will be clear from there. So I would absolutely say to people, spend some time thinking about that and then articulate it. Actually practice it. Actually say it out loud. So find people, trusted people. You can say, listen, I think this is how I'm going to talk about my business. Can I just run this past you? And you run it past them. What do you think? How does it make you feel? Ask those questions. What do they feel when they listen to you speak? What do they think about you and the business when you speak? And be really clear about what you want them to do. So is it clear to your listener about that next step? So I would say, clarify who you are, what you stand for, what you are about in terms of a business, you as a business owner and the business itself. And then go and practice it, articulate it, and make sure it's really clear to your listeners what you want them to be thinking, feeling and doing in whilst they're listening to you and the doing bit is really important and we often forget that bit what would you like your listener to do next subscribe to your podcast would you like to you know would you like them to uh, connect with you on linkedin do you want them to come and come to a workshop what is it you want them to do but really make that clear and i think we often forget that bit we're just kind of like well that's me and then we just kind of leave it and then the other person doesn't know what to do with that information so i think those would be two really key parts to helping get your mind in the right place and start telling yourself stronger stories about how you're communicating and how you could communicate with your audience. Yeah, it's, it's amazing how much of a difference the, in everything that you do, the, the stories you tell yourself and then who you believe you are and who you think you are, which is where you come into things like imposter syndrome, where mm -hmm. you get those feelings of not being good enough or not being worthy of something essentially and, and how important it is to get those things, those things handled. And I think after our when we had a conversation before, there were some things there where I like to think I've improved a little bit, but um, <laughs> compared to last time, but there's some things from that, that I took away from it, which really helped. And um, yeah, so from what you do, what are some of the biggest misconceptions that you see with, say, voice coaching or helping people to present? What are some of the misconceptions that you encounter? So misconceptions are that voice coaching is about elocution. Okay, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, we all need to be clear for sure, for sure. I was listening to something the other day and, and the person wasn't clear enough. And so the harder you have to work as a listener, the less time you're going to invest. So yeah, we do have to be clear, but voice coaching is not about elocution, nor is it about showing somebody what to do. So you're going to stand here and you're going to do this, you're going to do that, you're going to do the other. Really, the, the truth of it is about getting down to how do you help this person shine? Because we all have a natural personality, we all have a natural credibility, we all have a natural charisma. And it's all different, you know, some people's are 10 plus and some people's are two or three, but everybody has a way of being authentically themselves. So really, voice coaching is about taking the person as they are, helping them understand all the things that they're already really, really good at when it comes to communicating, and then giving them some additional skills to make that even better, and then saying, look, there you go. That's you. You're just a bit shinier. Turning yourself up like 10% is what I say to people. It's about taking you and making you more you so that you're genuinely connecting to the right kinds of audiences. It's not about layering a bunch of skills on the top because in the first stressful situation, those skills will go out the window and you'll just revert back to the old habits that you had before. Um, so it's really important that we we start with the mindset stuff before you start building on the skills because otherwise they just won't stick. It's a bit like, you know, you did martial arts. You can probably teach somebody martial arts moves, but unless they've got the right mindset to be a really good martial artist, they'll never be particularly good. They'll be perfectly competent, but they'll never be an athlete. They'll never kind of make it past a certain stage. 
because they haven't got the right mindset. So it's really about kind of getting the right mindset and then adding in the right skills and the practice and the opportunities. And then you can develop a good speaker because good speakers, they're not born, they're made. And that's really, really important. It comes from practice. So those people you watch out there who are amazing or you listen to them and think, oh my God, they're so smooth, they're so slick, they're incredible. They have practiced. They have practiced, they've messed it up, they've screwed it up a number of times, but they've gone back to it, they've learned and they're making it better. They're iterating themselves and the process each time. Yeah, it's interesting when you say about the martial arts side of things because I initially, when I first started, tried to learn from books and a couple of videos and mm. actually... It wasn't until I went and had an instructor or went to a class that you truly understand how to use those moves or how to use those techniques and how they actually work with your body. But definitely it is through that practice. And yeah, like you said, I could teach people how to do it, but until they continually practice and understand what that feels like and what it's all about, they're not going to be able to take it on board. Because it's only like the fifth time or the 10th time or the 20th time you do something particularly when it's a physical thing and speaking is a whole body thing. It, we tend to think it happens in your head, especially in sort of 21st century Western world. But actually it's a whole body thing because you're breathing from your body. Your voice is coming out of your body. You know, until we've done something multiple times, it's only then that you feel it differently in your body. Something would shift or change and you kind of go, ah, oh, that's what she's talking about. That's what she means. And then that can become integrated into your practice. So you're right, it's about doing it over and over. I used to always say that speaking is an act of doing. Like you say, you could read a hundred books about presenting, you could watch several videos, but it's only when you do it yourself in your body, you start to learn it, you get it. It becomes an embodied practice. In terms of presenting, so if you're in front of a group of people, so public speaking and stuff like that, what are some of the things that you see with people, one that holds them back from doing the best they can in that environment? And also, are there any things that, you advise in that situation to help increase the warmth of a presentation? I think the number one thing that happens that really trips people up is self-censoring. So as they're speaking, they are censoring what's happened. They're doing the whole, oh, I didn't mean to say that word, or I've stumbled on that word, or, oh God, that slide's coming up. They're going to ask me about that data. And I, oh, uh, I, I don't feel confident. And someone's going to ask me that really and so they're self-censoring. So, so they've got this narrative that's running at the same time as they're trying to connect with their audience and speak. That's really difficult to control because it's like trying to watch the television and have a radio on at the same time. You can't hear or focus on either of those things, which means you're not going to be connecting with that audience and you're not comfortable. So if you're not comfortable as a speaker, your audience will not be comfortable either. They'll be kind of like slightly oh, this is going to go wrong in a minute because they'll sense your discomfort. So that self-censoring is really tricky and it really trips people up. And you can see it happening. You can watch someone's face and you can see it going on. So I would really advise people is that once you stand up to speak, really focus on that intention. Try to stop thinking about yourself. Think about the audience. What do I really, really want them to understand by the end of this half an hour? and just focus on that. That's really, really important. And then the second thing is about pausing. So sometimes when we stand up, we, we're like, right, I'm just gonna get through this and get through it as quickly as possible. And then we're just gonna get everything out all in one go. And then the audience don't get anything because they can't process what you're saying as quickly as you can. You know the material, you've lived with it, you've created this presentation. They're hearing this maybe for the first time. So definitely pausing will really help and it will stop you from stumbling over the next thing you're about to say. And in terms of warming up the voice, there's a really simple thing you can do. And that's think about someone you really like. So before you start, think about someone you really like, someone you really care about. And just, if you can, you can close your eyes. If you can't, you can do that kind of soft focus thing where you're looking off into the, the distance and not really looking at anything. Think about that person. And so that when you start speaking, you're speaking to them in that voice, that warm voice that you would use with your kids or your partner or your best friend, whatever it is, you know, that's the voice that you want to be using. Not this sort of slightly disembodied, oh my God, I'm presenting to people voice, which can come out when we start to feel a bit stressed. So it's just about thinking about that person we really like. So thinking about your kids or whatever, and then you're like, 
okay, this is who I'm going to be talking to. This is the voice I'm going to be using. And it just sounds warmer straight away. That's a great tip. That's a really <laughs> great tip. I was just thinking then of my daughter when you were saying that. And um, yeah, I can see how much of a difference that could make, you know, just, and also putting you at ease, make you feel a lot more confident, comfortable, authentic as well. I think it's somebody that you truly know. Absolutely. I mean, the other thing you can do is just think about smile and think about smiling in your throat. I know that sounds really mad because we can't do that, but just that sense of smiling in your throat actually just opens your throat. And the more open the throat is, the more the sound waves can bounce around and they bounce off each other and they multiply and then they make it sound richer, warmer, deeper, that more sort of chocolatey kind of radio presenter sound that we can get. Because when we're tense, when we're nervous, the throat closes up and actually makes everything smaller, which is why we get this little kind of funny voice that comes out when we're a bit nervous, because there's literally the, the space is smaller. So smiling in the throat and you can yawn as well. That's a brilliant thing to do. Just obviously not in front of your audience, <laughs> off to the side, have a nice yawn and that will also open up your throat. So there's lots of ways you can feel better and feel like the voice can be warmer. So who does it the best? Not the best, but who are some examples that do that really well? Michelle Obama is an absolute classic because when she started standing up and having to do speeches, when she became first lady, she was competent. She was really competent. She obviously stood up in court. She'd been very good at commanding that courtroom. She was very bright. She was perfectly competent. But I have to say, watching her develop over the years that she was first lady, by the time she did her last speech, when she was basically saying vote for Hillary, she was absolutely a hundred percent in control of that audience and a hundred percent in control of her material. She was guiding them through that whole thing. And she was so in command without being commanding. And I think she has real grace. And I think that's one of the key things that we want to develop in our leaders is this idea of grace. She was able to communicate with people without ever making anybody feel stupid. She took the high moral ground the high vocal ground. She just did it brilliantly. She was really in control. So I have to say, I think she's pretty amazing. And I also, in the same vein, love Jacinda Ardern. I think her way of communicating is incredible. She really speaks to people and she does it in a very human way. And I find that incredibly encouraging that these two women can bring their real kind of going to get a bit woo here, but their feminine energy to the world. They're not taking up their space in a masculine way. And yet they are still incredibly powerful and incredibly commanding. And I think that gives us real hope for female leaders in the future. Yeah. The thing that strikes me about Michelle Obama is the ease in as much as how at ease she makes you as a listener feel, but how she seems to be in herself. That yeah. kind of, yeah, like you said, that warmth that just comes through. I think there's great examples. So from your point of view, talking about developing your leadership credentials, how does what we've been talking about help to grow or build on your leadership credentials, your leadership skills? So you talked about Michelle Obama there and how she developed over that time. And initially she was a great presenter, like you said, but she sort of developed and grew into it. Mm -hmm. So how does developing your personal voice and changing the stories that you tell yourself help to build those blocks to great leadership? I think one of the things that happens is that you promote yourself in a different way. So there's a real kind of reluctance to self-promote, particularly amongst women. But I would say generally within the British population, we're not very good at doing the whole kind of, oh, I'm really good at this. We find it uncomfortable. When you start to develop the skill to, when you know who you are and you are able to talk about your skills in a kind of dispassionate way, so you're able to say, you know, I did this on this project and actually the result was this and we got this to happen for our clients or, you know, that's a really important skill to be able to do that where, like you just described, with ease. So you're comfortable saying the things that you're good at. It means your listeners are comfortable, are going to be more comfortable to hear it. They're going to hear that message. And the more able we are to kind of internally, positively self-promote, is really important to raising your visibility and your credibility. Now, obviously, you still need to be able to do that good job. But the, the way that we talk about what we have achieved and what we've done is really important. So people can see our achievements, but we're talking about them in a way that people can see our potential at the same time. Because that's really important. We want to be future pacing them. We want to be taking them to into what's possible, just like we do with our brands. It's like, 
look, okay, okay, I know you're stuck here and I know it's really painful, but actually, look, this is where you could be. And it's the same when we're working. We want to be taking the people that we work with, the people that are in charge of our promotions and our pay. Look, this is where I could take you. This is where I could be in the future. And making sure that that's really positively promoted and that you're comfortable talking about your owning your expertise. And you know, many of us are not comfortable owning our expertise and saying, I am good at this thing. I have practiced for 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. I am really good at this thing. So being able to do that is really, really important. I say to people, if you are in an organization and that's not clear, you're not able to do that. It's a bit like having a shop and then having no sign outside. <laughs> it's like people will walk by and they go, oh, I wonder what they do in there. It's the same thing. So you need to be able to have that very clear shop front and say, look, this is me. This is what I stand for and this is what I do. And I happily tell you all the things that I'm good at. So it does impact on your progression. And equally true if you're an entrepreneur, you know, you need to be able to do exactly the same so that your customers can see what it is that you do. They want credibility, they want certainty, and they want confidence from you before they're going to move into that buying phase. And that will come from the way you talk about yourself. And what role do you see leaders playing in the future? So, and how important are the leaders of today in shaping that future? Massively important. Absolutely massively. I think we've moved from a contract-based society. So, i.e., come and work for me, Chris, and I'm going to pay you, you know, five pounds an hour to do this job. And you'll come in at nine, you'll go home at five. And we've moved massively much more to kind of a mission-based society. Not everybody and not every job, but it's certainly shifting in that direction. So I'm going to buy into your business from a philosophical perspective, from a mission-driven perspective, much more than I am because you're going to pay me to come in at nine and leave at five. So the way that our leaders are communicating that mission to the world is going to attract or not the right kinds of talent to the organizations. It's going to attract the right kinds of customers. So unless there's congruency between the organization by the way that they talk about their mission, their passions, and the individual and the way they present themselves, unless it's congruent across all of those three things, you're not going to be attracting the right kinds of clients, customers, team members, whatever it might be. So I think that the leaders of today have, have a job that really has never existed before. Leaders have not had to do that before. They've not had to be this kind of this spokesperson, this voice, this um, kind of driving factor behind philosophy, behind their mission in a way that they really do have to do now. And that goes for solopreneurs right up to huge organizations. Because as a society, we're really quick now to go, hang on, you said this and now you're not doing that. You promised this and you're not doing it. So it's really important that there's a really clear congruency between all those areas. It's amazing how much social media has played into developing that and the kind of the breaking down of the doors. If you think back of the organizations of the 80s, early 90s, where it was kind of untouchable, you know, they were just these places you could never get to or never speak to. But now you have these open door transparent policies that need those people to step into and actually, like you said, drive things forward. And leadership skills are only going to get more important as years go on, because as you develop businesses and brands, and as we become more social and more open, you're going to need those people, like you said, that stand and deliver those missions and connect with the audience. Definitely. There's so much transparency now that, you know, there's nowhere to hide. I mean, you know, it's amazing because everybody has a voice now because of social media that has made that possible. Everyone has a voice, but that means those voices need to be managed within organizations as well. It's like, what does our organization going to stand for and stand up to is really, really important. So we need leaders that can take a stand and say, well, look, we're going to align with this. This is the way that we're going. We can't talk about everything, but we can talk about this. We have a platform and we have a, you know, a duty to talk about this thing now. But it's really important that leaders are able to do that in a way that's really truthful and authentic, because otherwise we will pick up on it as consumers. We'll go, mm, nah not buying that one <laughs> that's the thing isn't it it's so easy today to um yeah see when someone's being inauthentic and to for something to spread really quickly and i think culture management is something that's quite an interesting thing that's only going to get more important like you mm -hmm. said you've got these disparate people with voices especially even with the remote working that we have today for organizations and they have a platform 
themselves, each individually, to get their voice out there and how that can impact on the business and brand. All human beings have an internal and very fundamental desire to be seen and heard. So it's really important for leaders not only to be speaking, not only to have a very clear, be able to articulate their vision and their passion and their mission very, very clearly. They also need to be good listeners. They really need to listen internally and externally. Now, that doesn't mean they have to act on everything that they hear, but they have to be transparent about what they are going to act on and what they're not going to be, what they're not going to act on. And there's lots of research to show that employees are very, they're not happy, but they will accept difficult decisions that haven't gone their way as long as the organisation has been transparent and clear about how that decision has been made. It's when things get decided behind closed doors and it's not clear, there isn't sort of fair process that people get really upset. So being able to talk is a very important part of leadership, but also being able to genuinely listen is a vital, vital skill when it comes to communication. Yeah, definitely. It's been really good having you on. Thank you very much for coming on the Unified Brand Podcast. Where can people find out a little bit more about yourself and speaking at work? Thank you, Chris. It's been an absolute pleasure. They can find me on LinkedIn, Emma Wayner at LinkedIn. That's the best place to connect with me. Brilliant. I'll put all the details in the show notes. And uh, yeah, thanks very much. And potentially do a follow up down the line. Fantastic. Thanks, Chris. We've just put together a weekly brand tip video series, which is designed to help you to unlock your brand's potential and stand out from the competition. And if you're interested, if you just go to elements brand management or one word dot co dot uk forward slash weekly hyphen brand hyphen tips sign up and you'll be delivered a three to five minute video a week straight to your inbox i'll put a link in the show notes if you're interested if you enjoyed this episode and you'd like to receive more you can subscribe in all the usual places we're talking itunes spotify stitcher Please, if you get a chance, rate and review. It helps the podcast to kind of get a bit more visibility and allows us to keep on producing these podcasts. Have a great week. Catch up soon. Keep those brands unified.